Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Our Warming Planet webinar series. Thank you for joining us today. Let's give everyone a couple of minutes to join and then we can get started. Thank you. Hello everyone. We are just giving people a couple of minutes and we will start the webinar very soon. Thank you for being here today. Can people hear me? I did get uh, a message saying uh, that there isn't any talking. Um, okay, great. Okay, maybe it was while I was paused. If there are any issues with sound or the screen, please do let us know through the chat. Thanks so much, everyone. I think we can get started. Welcome everyone to the Our Warming Planet webinar series. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is our 15th bi-weekly webinar. And we started these uh, in, in February with the book launch. So really appreciate that a lot of you have, uh, you know, stuck with us uh, since the beginning of the year. And we are closing in on uh, the end of this webinar series as well. So we uh, are very fortunate to have some wonderful authors from the United Nations Environment Program to present today's lecture. Uh, this will be the last webinar lecture before the grand finale uh, in two weeks, where we will have the final lecture, uh, more on that in a bit, and we invite all of you to register for that as well. Once again, we will include that information in the chat, so you can register and don't, and uh, I think that's, that will be great because we're trying to get a lot of the authors to join us for that session, and it will be more interactive. So today's lecture is um, really interesting because it focuses on documenting the uptake of adaptation knowledge at the global level. And we have, uh, we have three authors from the United Nations Environment Program authoring this. And today we have uh, Ying Wang and Martin Capel from uh, the team. Jian Liu is unfortunately not able to uh, make it because uh, he's the chief, uh, he's the head of the uh, science division of UNEP and uh, has a very hectic schedule. So unfortunately he won't be able to join us today, but we are very fortunate to have Ying and Martin today. And let's start by going over the agenda briefly. So we will have a brief introduction about the book and the series. And we would also like to spend a few minutes getting to know our audience. Then we have Ying presenting her lecture. And then we have uh, the live Q&A session moderated by Jen, and we will have both Ying and Martin participate. Uh, and then David and I will uh, wrap up. Uh, so today's session will be about an hour. Uh, and on to the next slide, please. I would like to begin by introducing the editors of uh, Our Warming Planet, Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation. This book is in honor of Martin Parry, who is a pioneer on climate impacts and played a key role in the 2007 IPCC report. Martin is a visiting professor at the Center for Environmental Policy at Imperial College London. He was co-chair of IPCC Working Group 2, which focuses on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerability and a convening lead author in three IPCC assessments. He has been a professor of geography at the University of Oxford, University College London, and Universities of East Anglia and Birmingham in the UK. Cynthia Rosenzweig is a senior research scientist 
at NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies and Columbia's Center for Climate Systems Research, where she heads the Climate Impacts Group. She co-founded the Agricultural Model Intercomparison and Improvement Project, AgMEP, and she was a coordinating lead author for several IPCC assessments. Cynthia was named one of nature's 10 people who mattered in 2012 and has been the recipient of the Guggenheim Fellowship. In May 2022, that was just a few months ago, it was announced that Cynthia was the winner of the World Food Prize this year. So unfortunately, she's not able to join us because she is in Iowa uh, to receive the World Food Prize this week. Uh, this was unavoidable, but she uh, sends her best and is uh, disappointed that she's missing this lecture. And then on to the next slide, please. It gives me great pleasure to also introduce David Ryan, the series editor of Our Warming Planet. David is a senior NASA Research Emeritus at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. For more than 30 years, he was a climate research scientist for NASA, as well as an adjunct professor at Columbia University, teaching graduate level courses in climate dynamics and atmospheric dynamics. He has more than 300 publications relating to climate and climate change and is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and a recipient of many awards, including being a co-recipient of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize as a lead author on the IPCC. David, it's wonderful to have you uh, as always on these webinars. And it would be wonderful if you could take a couple of minutes to talk about um, the current book, but also the entire series. Over to you, David. Thanks, uh, Manishka. Yes, as probably many of you know now, these webinars are in association with textbooks. And the aim of these textbooks has been somewhat different from the canonical textbook. What these textbooks are supposed to do is provide an audience, including the general public, including uh, high school and college students, high school and college teachers, information which they will then have available to disseminate to those who they may find uh, would have an interest in it. And to do that, the textbooks have, in addition to write-ups on specific topics, about 20 in each book, they also include PowerPoint slides that are available for downloading that people can then use in their own talks under whatever, uh, whatever goal they have in mind for that. Therefore, uh, it's, the goal is to try to make this available to a much wider audience than textbooks on scientific topics usually are aimed. In conjunction with that, these webinars allow an additional dimension to these talks by having the authors actually provide the talks themselves using many of the same slides that are in the book. So you get the expert's point of view and the nuances associated with the slides for, for further uh, to further enhance your capability. As uh, Manishka said, there are three, this is part of a series. The first book uh, was focused on climate dynamics, the physical climate system. This book obviously is associated with impacts and adaptation. And the third book, which is in imminent release is on clouds and uh, precipitation processes. And of the three, this particular book is the most widely utilizable by people. Because as this talk that we're gonna to hear today focuses on, uh, this information is of great necessity to everybody around the world. So um, we're very lucky to have, as, as Manishka said, 15 uh, talks so far associated with the different chapters uh, with one more uh, coming up in two weeks. And uh, ultimately, these uh, webinars have been really, really wonderful. So back to you, Manishka. I've, so far, I think this has really been tremendously successful. Thanks so much, David. And you got to know um, the co-editors, the series editor, and very soon you'll hear a little bit more about Ying and Martin. But we also like to get to know our audience. So I have a short poll um, and it's been really fun to run these 
So I'm gonna ask uh, all of you to vote in so we can get to know all of you and uh, see who is in our audience today. So let's start with the first question. So this is to understand where you are joining us from today. Um, so which geographical region are you based in? You know, we try to fix these webinars at a time that works for uh, most regions, especially given that we do have some authors also from the US West Coast where it's, you know, quite early still in the day. So it doesn't work for everyone, uh, but we do, uh, uh, you know, the aim is to try and get as many uh, joining us from across the world as possible. So we have about 72% uh, of our audience that have participated. We have a few more voting in. So I'm gonna stop uh, the poll. We have about three quarters participating and I'm going to share the results. So we have representation from North America, Asia, Europe, Latin America and Caribbean. Um, we unfortunately don't have participants from Africa today, although technically Martin is based uh, there. So uh, we do want to get participants from across the world. So if people have ideas in terms of how we can expand our audience, especially for the final session, to, please do let us know in the chat. And I think it's far too late in Oceania. So uh, I think uh, that's uh, hard to expect participants from that region. Uh, we would also like to know which sector uh, you work in. And in the past, we've actually had very good representation across sectors, which, which has been really wonderful to see. So please uh, participate in the poll. We now have almost half of you that have participated. So I'll give it about 10, 15 seconds more. So we have over 50% now. And let's wait a little bit more. And we are almost at three quarters. So I'm going to end the poll and share the results with all of you. So once again, we have a pretty good um, representation of, of many sectors here. So really wonderful to see this. And then we are. We also would like to know your involvement in climate change work. So please participate. Uh, and once again, we've had uh, people with different levels of involvement in climate change. It's been really wonderful to have such a diverse audience. And I can see that even today. We have about two thirds of the audience that have participated in the poll. Let's just give it a few more seconds. Okay, a few more seconds and I will um, share the results, wonderful. So once again, we, we have uh, people who are you know, working directly, people who would like to uh, be involved and educate people about climate change. So it's really wonderful to have all of you today. Thank you everyone for participating in, in the poll. We also um, like to get to know you on a more individual level. So as we begin, please start introducing yourselves in the chat and share as much or as little information as you like. So feel free to include your name, country, institution, role, email, how you think this book might help you, uh, whatever information you'd like to share with us. So please use the chat function for this. And I can just also mention that in the chat so you can start sharing your information. Wonderful. Um, next slide, please. So now we get to the core of this uh, webinar, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce Ying Wang, who currently serves as the Secretariat Coordinator of the World Adaptation Science Program at the United Nations Environment Program. She has experience in country level climate change in in country level climate change impact assessments, environmental policy making, and 
multilateral environmental agreement negotiation and implementation. I want to say a special thank you to Ying because she is currently based in China where it is 10 p.m. So it's very late. And Ying recently returned from maternity leave uh, just weeks ago. So really appreciate you taking the time to do this thing. And I also want to congratulate on your baby. Uh, and thanks so much for being here. I also want to introduce Martin Capel. He's the head of the scientific thematic assessments at UNEP Science Division uh, based in Nairobi. Um, and he is currently working on a range of thematic integrated environmental assessments, keeping the global environment under review for policy and decision making. And this is all aimed towards achieving the sustainable development goals of Agenda 2030. He holds a 30 year track record of successful transitions that establish new structures and directions for long term horizons in environmental program development, backed by sound, leading edge scientific credibility. Wonderful to have you today as well, Martin. And Jian Liu, who's uh, the third author of uh, this lecture, is the director of the science division at the United Nations Environment Program. Unfortunately, given his schedule, he can't make it today, but we are really fortunate to have both Ying and Martin here today. So over to you, Ying. Um, Jen will share the screen and uh, we, we can get started very soon. Thank you, uh, Manishka, and uh, thank you everyone for being uh, here today with us. And uh, uh, I see Jennifer is sharing her screen. So uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, uh, we hear good. you fine, Ying, thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, then uh, I will start. Uh, as introduced by Manishka, my name is Ying Wang, and I work uh, for United Nations Environment Program uh, in Science Division. And uh, uh, today I'm going to talk about documenting the uptake adaptation at the global level. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as you all know, uh, at COP21 in Paris, uh, on uh, 12th December uh, 2015, uh, parties to the UNFCCC uh, reached a landmark agreement to combat climate change and to accelerate and intensify the actions and investments needed for a sustainable low carbon future. Uh, the Paris Agreement's uh, central aim is to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change by keeping a global temperature rise this century well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase even further to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Additionally, uh, the agreement aims to increase the ability of uh, countries to deal with the impacts of climate change uh, and at making finance flows consistent with the low uh, greenhouse uh, gas uh, emissions and the climate resilience pathway. Uh, the, uh, in the evaluation and the monitoring uh, schemes, a global stock take uh, will happen every five years to assess the collective uh, process towards achieving the purpose of the agreement. Uh, the first uh, round of a global stock take has already been uh, in process uh, uh, starting from 2021 to 2023 and hope uh, the uh, all parties are uh, put forward their best efforts uh, through the NDCs and the NAPs. Uh, from there, uh, the information was well gathered and uh, uh, for, for filled into the global stock take. Uh, next slide, please. The global stock take uh, established uh, under Article 14 of the Paris Agreement. So uh, it's uh, uh, official requirement of this agreement and uh, uh, it's uh, towards achieving the purpose of the agreement and its long-term goals. Um, as said, it's, it takes place uh, every five years. So the first round, uh, the first report should be ready in 2023. The outcome of the global stock take uh, show inform inform parties in updating and enhancing in a nationally determined manner uh, their actions and uh, support in accordance with the relevant provisions of the agreement. 
as well as in enhancing international collaboration for climate actions. As illustrated uh, in the graphs, the second round of NDCs inform COP26 if first NDCs run to 2025, or updated NDCs if first NDC run to 2030. The first global stock take occur in 2023 to inform the third round of NDCs in 2025. Likewise, the second global stock take will happen in 2028, which is five years after the first round, to inform the fourth round of NDCs in 2030. Uh, in between, there uh, are the, the sixth round of IPCC assessment reports, uh, three special reports in uh, published in 2018 and 2019, and uh, the official AR6 reports released uh, in late 2021 and uh, early early 2022. Uh, so you can see the mechanism of the Paris Agreement is really working in a five years uh, uh, circle, circles. Next slide, please. Uh, the urgent and intensive demands on action taken to adapt the warming climate is clearly stated uh, in the IPCC report and have been revisited and reaffirmed by other articles and the publications on climate change afterwards. Uh, we can see the uh, summarized uh, key information is quite clear uh, and uh, uh, going through the IPCC assessment uh, since AR5, uh, the window of opportunity to uh, contain the temperature rising well below two degrees Celsius is closing and the climate risks and impacts are documented and observed uh, through nature and uh, human sy uh, systems. In addition, available evidence shows uh, as the temperature uh, rise goes uh, above 1.5 degrees Celsius, adaptation may be con uh, con uh, constrained or have reduced effectiveness uh, uh, when uh, take actions. Uh, in this uh, regard, governments have uh, strengthened and uh, really skilled up their efforts to address uh, climate change uh, adaptation. A clear indicator uh, to this is the number of uh, published policies on climate change uh, is really increasing. Uh, especially in Europe, Asia, and Africa region. Next slide, please. Uh, so after over like uh, uh, 25 years work on fighting uh, climate change, uh, there is like uh, some common ground uh, of understanding adaptation and climate change impacts. Uh, first is uh, the definition of, that, of adaptation and its uh, goal at the global level is uh, still considered as very general and blur. And secondly, uh, there is no silver bullet solutions for adaptation, including it's like a monitoring and evaluation. Currently, uh, the universally taken actions on adaptation, including but uh, not limited to uh, the uh, five catalogs uh, listed below, uh, like still uh, like setting up monitoring and early warning systems, building resilience into ecosystems and the social systems uh, to uh, confront disasters uh, induced by climate change, structural uh, re uh, reorganization of the financial and uh, uh, business uh, uh, models re-establishing the uh, governance uh, uh, policies uh, and uh, institu institutionalized establishment, uh, capacity building and knowledge management with inputs from multi-stakeholders from uh, uh, diversified levels. Uh, other than uh, above mentioned uh, measures, there are also a lot of action taken, including better planning to uh, be claimed as contributing to build resilience. Uh, to the changing climate. Uh, also, actions can always uh, uh, be taken uh, across various regions, sectors, and uh, at different levels of skills. Next slide, please. Uh, adaptation as a key pillar of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change 
you know, as a, a browser to the mitigation uh, requires parties to implement adaptation measures through national plans, climate information systems, early warnings, uh, protective measure, and investments in a green uh, future. National level adaptation planning process is actually a critical uh, element in the global response to the impacts of climate change as uh, underscored uh, by the uh, Paris Agreement. Um, the UNEP Adaptation Gap Report uh, assessed uh, uh, the, uh, the submit submitted national uh, determined contributions and national adaptation plans. Uh, around 79% uh, of all countries actually have now adopted at least one national level adaptation planning instrument, including a plan strategy, uh, policy, or law. Uh, most developing countries are preparing national adaptation plans. Furthermore, uh, nine percent of countries that do not currently have such an instrument in place is actually in the process to develop one. Uh, at least 65 uh, percent of countries uh, have one or more sectoral plans in place, and at least 26 uh, percent uh, have one or more subnational planning instruments. Uh, as the will is there uh, to fulfill the plan, huge gaps uh, remain, uh, particularly in finance for developing countries and uh, bring adaptation projects to the stage where they can uh, bring real reductions in climate risks. Uh, as the international uh, public adaptation finance is slowing rising from uh, 30 billion uh, US dollars or 5% of tracked climate funds annually. Yet the annual adaptation costs uh, in developing countries are estimated at 70 billion US dollars. So the gap is uh, around 40 uh, billion US dollars. Uh, this figure is expected to reach around 100 to 300 billion US dollars by 2030 and uh, uh, 280 to 500 billion US dollars by 2050. Uh, in addition, in will of uh, updated NDCs and the NAPs, uh, actually the uh, estab establishment of uh, estimates of adaptation financing needs are increasing uh, hugely uh, in many countries. Uh, it's, so it's a very general uh, phenomenon. Uh, to cover uh, or incorporate uh, more sectors uh, to acce uh, accelerate implementation of adaptation, both public and private finance need to step up urgently, uh, giving the uh, huge increased uh, demands on adaptation finance. Next slide, please. Long-term uh, impact of uh, disaster climate events uh, for example, the Australian uh, wildfire in 2019 and early 2020 uh, actually remain unclear and the cost of loss damage is uh, difficult to est estimate. Uh, more than 20% uh, of uh, uh, Australian's forest burned during that period and uh, uh, from information uh, in the public news and uh, studies, uh, thousands of homes and properties has been uh, destroyed and uh, at least uh, 33 people has been killed. Smoke caused uh, more than 400 estimated uh, excess uh, deaths. Uh, the economic loss uh, has been uh, um, calculated uh, at more than 4 billion US dollars uh, level. Um, also, welfare can uh, you know, negative, uh, negatively impact water catchment, uh, change soil composition. Uh, they also significantly affect uh, vegetation's uh, on multi scales from uh, landscape to individual plants and uh, uh, can be uh, uh, devastating to wildlife too. Uh, during the fair, uh, you know, it can, they can get killed and uh, for some animals, post-fair habitat change uh, is also uh, unadaptable. Uh, uh, also, uh, some animals may have been driven to extinction. So the uh, ecosystem uh, loss is also huge. Um, 
climate change and wildfire are mutually uh, exacerbating uh, the possibility and uh, uh, frequency and the intensiveness of wildfire events uh, for a given year at the globe. Uh, like this one, the Australians uh, 2019 to 2020 Black Summer, uh, all the huge Arctic uh, fires, you know, in 2020 is likely to increase um, by up to 40% by 2030 and 30% by the end of uh, 2050, according to a new report uh, UNAP recently published on wildfires. Uh, so kindly noted uh, in this kind uh, of uh, environmental uh, disasters, it is almost not possible to adapt uh, and uh, uh, the conditions uh, are uh, easily uh, to uh, fall into catastrophic and uh, uh, excess, uh, ex uh, ex uh, ca escalating, uh, sorry, escalating uh, conditions. Um, and their impacts and the induced loss and the damages can only be partially uh, contained. Next slide, please. Um, another uh, example uh, can be given is the reinsurance uh, industry, uh, which is an insurance that uh, uh, an insurance company purchased from another insurance company uh, to insulate itself or partially from a risk of a major claim event. Uh, with reinsurance, the company passed on uh, some part of its own insurance uh, liabilities to other insurance companies. Uh, according to the uh, economic, uh, economic of Climate Adaptation Working uh, Group of Swiss Re, which is the world's leading providers of reinsurance and insurance uh, service, up to 65% of climate risks can be uh, averted under current scenarios. Uh, in the short term, climate change uh, will uh, affect uh, underwriting practice uh, by uh, necess necessitating uh, risk uh, uh, quantification approaches that include a forward-looking view of risk that is not purely uh, grounded in historical experience. In the long term, insufficient adaptation in case of uh, uh, rising risks could threaten the concept of uh, uh, insurability itself uh, by limiting the availabilities and affordabilities of private insurance coverage. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there are uh, clear obstacles uh, to act at the government level and uh, uh, for the financial and the private sector levels uh, to take action, um, as uh, indicated in the uh, slide. Um, for the government level, uh, the additional cost and the burden uh, for taking actions uh, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, hindered um, in uh, advancing adaptation. And for the financial sectors and private sectors, uh, lack of clear method or measurements is uh, a problem for them to uh, actually do the cost uh, benefit assessment for investments. Uh, urgent actions are needed on tracking adaptation programs at global level. Uh, so there are some really key questions uh, uh, needs answer before we can uh, document the progress or reach agreement on uh, where are we uh, at the global level? So the baselines for adaptation, the adaptation sectors, uh, uh, which sectors is taking actions and uh, who is adapting, uh, what drafts adaptation and uh, which stage of adaptation is being described and what is uh, uh, you know, adaptation achieving is really uh, at the center of the attention for uh, us to uh, track adaptation. Next slide, please. Uh, the current approach uh, to monitor and evaluate uh, global adaptation programs, uh, similar to tracking programs on greenhouse gas uh, mitigations, but more uh, complicated uh, comparing with uh, uh, that 
is relying on a country level uh, reporting system, context re uh, relevant indicators and metrics, uh, both in terms of results and progresses with uh, uh, the UNFCCC secretary assembling information at the global level. Uh, whereas bodies within or related to the UNFCCC have been contributing to the global stock take of adaptation. Uh, for example, the adaptation committees, uh, the adaptation communication under the ad hoc working group of the Paris Agreement, and the, the recent established uh, working programs on global goal adaptation and the technical group on the global stock take. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the issue of how to build up, uh, you know, the relationship between national adaptation action, global adaptation goal, and uh, uh, the global stock take uh, is still under discussion among parties uh, to UNFCCC. And there are also uh, various, uh, you know, uh, resources we can use to contributing to the global stock take besides the, the national, uh, you know, reporting uh, systems uh, under the convention. Uh, we can uh, uh, look at the published literatures, uh, you know, uh, really credible, credible reports like IPCC reports, uh, UNEP adaptation gap reports, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, we have the, uh, you know, project uh, evaluation and uh, documents like the adaptation funds are tracking their uh, funded uh, projects. Uh, GCF and GF have the same. Uh, uh, UNFCC also, uh, you know, uh, additionally call for submissions to uh, specified uh, topics uh, like uh, global stock take or global goal adaptation. And that could be, uh, you know, the materials will be considered and assessed by the secretary to uh, uh, assembled into the um, report to uh, GST at the global level. Next slide, please. Uh, so the uh, possibilities uh, to highlight, you know, uh, the trajectory of global adaptation lines uh, in providing clear and efficient information on the state of adaptation with a regular revision. Uh, for example, every five years, uh, uh, as in, uh, you know, indicate in the Paris Agreement, uh, the uh, global stock take. Uh, the four functions of the global stock take related to adaptation are defined uh, in the Paris Agreement. Um, as mentioned, the first uh, global stock take will run from 2021 to 2023 and will be uh, repeated every five years afterwards. Uh, the uh, global stock take facilitates uh, the assessment of global collective uh, progress on three semantic areas. Uh, in mitigation, adaptation, and the means of uh, implementation. Um, so adaptation is actually a key component uh, to the global stock take. Uh, and the global stock take also considers the social and the economic uh, consequences of response measures and efforts to address loss and damage uh, in addition to the three semantic areas mentioned. Uh, the collective assessment taking, uh, you know, inputs, uh, takes inputs on uh, equity into uh, consideration, equity uh, into consideration and make use of the best available science uh, in a cross-cutting manner. Next slide, please. Mm, so on the technical side, uh, it is also noted that the uh, world of current uh, adaptation practices actions uh, are taken in the absence of large-scale assessments of uh, how people are adapting and uh, in-depth in -depth information about the cost and uh, benefits. Uh, except for the uh, conceptual uh, ambiguity of the nature of adaptation and the confusion caused because uh, acting on adaptation development and planning, uh, it appears there are two main uh, reasons. You know, firstly, uh, diversity draw, uh, actually uh, um, dr um, grows or like uh, uh, appears when uh, analytical methods are applied from nature science uh, 
and so uh, from nature science to social science. Secondly, most of the documented adaptation come from individual research project uh, and programs or from like uh, uh, different institutions using different formats, uh, which are not comprehensive, giving the you know, self-selecting uh, uh, voluntary submission process. Uh, and the provision of any assessment of the frequency or the, you know, spa uh, spatial spread of adaptation actions. Uh, this situation is uh, actually further uh, complicated by a lack of universal goals at a global level adaptation, uh, including metrics approaches, uh, which, uh, uh, you know, uh, cause no, you know, transparent and uh, comparable methodologies. Uh, to assess adaptation needs and no, uh, you know, methodologies at global level to review the adequacy and the effectiveness of action and support. Um, next slide, please. Uh, to understand uh, whether we are on track to adapt uh, on the rapid changing climate, uh, we, uh, you know, uh, have to uh, uh, actually uh, seize the opportunities. Um, it is a mandate actually written in the Paris Agreement uh, to uh, track adaptation uh, as uh, mentioned in the uh, global stock kick process and also uh, to achieve the global goal on adaptation. Uh, in the interest of uh, uh, private sectors, financial sectors, and uh, other stakeholders, uh, as agreed uh, at COP24 in uh, Katowice, uh, uh, Poland, in December 2018, uh, continued uh, debates about uh, you know, the definition of adaptation, so it should uh, no longer uh, impede uh, progress on documenting adaptation. Uh, so the uh, priority is to uh, create a baseline as a starting point of the global stock take. Uh, uh, there are plenty of uh, you know opportunities in addressing the challenges we are facing for implementing the global stock take. Uh, at least uh, uh, here, uh, the guidelines uh, uh, the uh, could be uh, useful to chart the way. And uh, there are also some regional platforms or like uh, uh, collaborative platforms uh, to uh, uh, cultivate, uh, uh, you know, uh, partnerships and uh, collecting data, uh, assess uh, climate risks uh, based on data available or like uh, uh, country submissions or project based informations. Uh, also, uh, the collaboration, you know, with other in international efforts uh, could be uh, a solution. Uh, for example, the uh, reporting systems or the metrics used under other international conventions, uh, the, um, the Convention on uh, Disaster Risk Reduction and the Convention on Biodiversity uh, 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 Conservation. So it it could, uh, how to say that, uh, um, uh, be considered when we are uh, doing the global stock take uh, or like identify metrics or methods uh, to um, track adaptation uh, progress at the global level. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, aside uh, from, you know, the country driven process uh, or monitoring programs, made adaptation as led by the UNFCCC, uh, the way to implement the global stock take adaptation is still under discussion among parties to the Paris Agreement. As mentioned before, uh, there are lots of uh, initiatives, uh, uh, programs, uh, approaches, and uh, publications aimed to contribute to the global stock take. Um, uh, uh, in addition, uh, the uh, World Adaptation Science Program, uh, IPCC reports, adaptation gap reports, uh, and uh, the World Environment, uh, Environment Situation Room uh, could uh, contribute uh, to the uh, global stock take process. Uh, related uh, guidance actually um, has been published uh, 
some of the guidance are available on assessment of climate change vulnerability impacts uh, and adaptation, uh, study the status and trends of uh, adaptation, uh, including methodologies, indicators, and mapping the inputs uh, from other initiatives and programs uh, will actually further complete the picture uh, at the global level. Uh, more information can be found on their official website. Uh, next slide, please. So with that, I think I uh, close my presentation and uh, uh, I would like to welcome my, uh, the my colleague and the co-author, <laughs> Martin Capel, to join me at the uh, Q&A session. Thank you so much, Ying, for that wonderful and comprehensive lecture. It's really helpful to get a global picture on adaptation. And I think tracking and documentation is so fundamental to get a better understanding of progress uh, over time. So thank you, not only for the lecture, but also to you, Martin and Jan, and everyone else at uh, UNEP for doing this wonderful work. So right now, I think um, we have um, we, we had one question in the Q&A, but I'm going to hand over to uh, Jen. Jen, over to you to uh, moderate the Q&A session. Sure. OK, so I yeah, we did have one question. It seems to have disappeared, but I do remember it. So I'll start uh, with that in case um, it was an accident. Um, but someone asked uh, the uh, in summary, whether there's any discussions about geoengineering being discussed at UNEP or at the international level in terms of uh, I think it was more specific to the US, but We'll ask it that way. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to take that question, uh, Jennifer. Sure. Right, right. So actually, I, I got the question here. It says the White House is coordinating a five-year research plan to study ways of modifying the amount of sunlight that reaches the Earth to temper the effects of global warming. And this process is often called solar geoengineering or sunlight reflection or solar radiation modification. So the question here on this is how likely could a similar international policy be incorporated in future climate planning sessions? Uh, th this is very interesting for us, uh, this question, because uh, we have uh, received such questions from some governments, uh, including uh, the Swiss government some years ago at the UN Environment Assembly in Nairobi. Uh, the UN Environment Assembly is like the uh, General Assembly in New York, but it's the Environment Assembly, which is for environment ministers, ministers of the environment uh, from across the world. They gather every two years in Nairobi to discuss environmental policies. So there was a request from Switzerland to look into this, to do a study, to undertake an assessment on the geoengineering technologies available and you know what their potential is, what is their impact, what could be their impact, you know, look at the pros and cons of these technologies. Unfortunately, at the time, uh, the, the proposed resolution to the UN Environment Assembly by Switzerland and some other countries, I did not make it until, uh, you know, for, for adoption by member states. So in the end, there was, uh, there was no uh, consensus among member states to undertake or to request the UN Environment Programme to undertake an assessment on this topic. However, uh, the discussions, of course, are uh, ongoing. And uh, right now, uh, member states are discussing these ideas, but we have not received any formal request because we need we can't just undertake as a United Nations organization uh, such uh, studies without the backing of member states. Member states of the United Nations need to give us uh, a mandate through a resolution to be adopted at the UN Environment Assembly. That's how we work. That's just like the General Assembly works in New York. So uh, in relation to this, there are, of course, a number of studies happening, but not necessarily they are endorsed by the United Nations as a whole at this point. But let me make one point clear, right, uh, which is actually that the focus uh, at, uh, at our program, but also at uh, uh, other UN agencies, is to uh, uh, 
let's say, to uh, promote and advocate the reduction of emissions. We need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And, you know, this is more important. This is about prevention. Uh, we can always uh, look at uh, uh, at curation, right? Yeah. You better prevent you don't get sick rather than getting sick and uh, get a cure from a doctor, right? So the the the, the solar radiation technologies to uh, to reflect back the sunlight, etc. I mean that is like another uh, option, like a plan B. The plan A really is let's work towards the Paris Agreement goals for 2030, which is about reducing emissions. To, uh, to ensure we do not go above 1.5 or 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, right? So, so that is really important. And right now we are on the way to, uh, you know, we are at 1.2 degrees Celsius climate change right now. And we are on the way with the current emissions, we are on the way to 2.6 or 2.8 degrees temperature increase by the end of the century. And it could be worse, which is the high end uh, climate change impacts that we might see. We can go up to three if we just continue to burn fossil fuels. Uh, so that should be our main focus. And of course, we don't know, you know, uh, what are the, the side effects of solar radiation uh, modification, uh, you know, or, or alteration uh, through geoengineering. Uh, so at some point, we really need to do an assessment in that regard, but we have not formally received a mandate for member states to undertake that as a United Nations. I'll stop here to allow for other questions. Sorry for taking so long. Back to you, Jennifer. Not a problem. We do have another question um, from Steve Soifer um, saying the chart showing levels of funding by individual nations was a bit disappointing. Do you anticipate that global economic downturn will make it even worse? Right, that's a very good question. Uh, I'm not sure, Ying, do you want to take that question or you want me to answer? Uh, I can share actually uh, a very positive message is uh, uh, the uh, UN is actually urge uh, the eco share for adaptation and uh, mitigation. So uh, for the multilateral uh, um, banks or the uh, climate funds managed under UNFCCC, uh, we are really strive to, to um, how to say that, put uh, more uh, financial flow into adaptation. Um, not like mentioned in the chat that 5% uh, of the um, tracked uh, climate funds uh, goes to adaptation. That's the previous uh, data. Um, currently, uh, uh, we actually uh, looking forward to receive like more money into adaptation uh, actually uh, from the uh, the uh, multilateral channels uh, but I leave it to Martin to add more comprehensive information on that front yeah yeah thank you Ying, for that for that part yeah so let, let me just add to that you know there are a few important things here uh, first of all, I would like to refer to an Oxfam publication that just came out the past, uh, I think it was yesterday, which highlighted clearly that, you know, we are not on the, on track towards the 100 billion US dollars that we need to get adaptation in place, uh, particularly for developing and vulnerable countries, also in relation to what is called loss and damage uh, under one of the articles uh, uh, of the Paris Agreement. So, uh you know, let, 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 me say, uh, let me tell you that on uh, the 3rd of November, the Unifirement Program is launching the uh, annual Adaptation Gap Report, which is looking into adaptation uh, planning, finance, and implementation. So there is a part on the adaptation finance. It is providing the latest information, and authors are right now working on it, uh, to provide the latest information on what we call the Adaptation Finance Gap. Uh, which is the gap that we need to fill to meet uh, Paris Agreement goals and, you know, the 100 billion uh, targets, etc., to make sure that we get uh, adaptation finance in place for those vulnerable countries. We have just seen what happened in, in Pakistan in terms of flooding. You know, we see increased hurricanes in the Caribbean. We see uh, major droughts in, uh, for instance, uh, Eastern Africa, the Horn of Africa, Somalia, Ethiopia, South Sudan, you know, where people are starving and, and cattle is dying. 
right? So, I mean, there's a lot of loss and damage. There's a lot of adaptation needs. We need to build resilience. Uh, we have to reduce uh, vulnerabilities, et cetera, and money is needed to get that going. So the question was actually uh, on the downturn, the economic downturn, how is it affecting uh, the financial flows? So this is a really important one. I mean, we have we are facing, the world is facing because there are some major conflicts uh, in Eastern Europe, other parts of the world that are triggering an energy crisis and a food crisis, right? So we need to tackle the energy crisis and we should make sure we invest in renewables, right? And then, of course, if we get quickly working on renewables and reduce emissions, then later we will need less money for adaptation. Otherwise, I mean, we're already too late to some extent. We need more money for adaptation. So probably the economic downturn will have an impact on current uh, funding flows, but we expect that it will pick up after the current recession that the world is seeing because of the energy and food crisis, right? Uh, so probably by, by mid next year, it should be picking up, but the hurry needs to, you know, we should have taken advantage of the uh, post-COVID recovery plans, you know, uh, building back better in the US and there are other global plans, the EU had plans, uh, other parts of the world, uh, um, Asia Development Bank, African Development Bank, they have plans to invest heavily in post-COVID recovery, but now, of course, with the food and energy crisis, that is uh, getting into jeopardy. But hopefully next year, we have good hopes it will pick up again, but we go, need to go the extra mile. Otherwise, you know, we are not ready for the upcoming, the current and the upcoming uh, climate change. Back to you, Jennifer. Okay, well, I want to make sure we wrap up before the end of the hour, but I wanted to pass it off to David to see uh, if he had any questions he, he wanted to ask Martin and Yang, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. So I had always viewed adaptation as certainly less controversial than mitigation, only for the sake that mitigation often involves certain industries and people actually losing money in the near term as switches are made to different energy sources. Whereas adaptation, I always thought of as well, this is all for people's benefit. They can actually sort of make money. But now I understand from your presentation that the thing they have in common, both mitigation and adaptation, is that they require money to be put up front for the sake of some, some maybe even next year, but downstream uh, advantage. And inertia comes into play and short-sightedness comes into play. I know pe people have always said that long-term economic thinking is six months, basically. The, the long-term economic models just do six-month projections. Um, so I guess the question I have for you, Ying, in terms of documenting adaptation, what really counts as adaptation? Is it whether it is useful uh, in the sense of helping mitigate the impacts of climate change, or is it the goal of the people doing it? So for example, if somebody switches from one product to the next, which is more environmentally friendly and um, less susceptible to climate change. But the reason they did it was because it's less expensive and they can make more money. Does that still count as adaptation? Does their goal have to be uh, to make things more climate resilient or does it not matter? And you can count anything as adaptation that fulfills that goal regardless of why they did it. Uh, actually, that's a very good question. And uh, uh, I think uh, what I can share is, uh, as uh, indicated in your question, for the economic thinking, six months, you know, is the maximum, which means, you know, for a longer goal or for long term uh, planning, we really look into the future, the uncertainty is like increasing hugely. It's almost, uh, you know, unmanageable or, un, you know, accountable. But uh, in adaptation, we have a very good saying, say like uh, not everything counts can be counted and not everything can be counted counts. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's really the case for adaptation. And uh, for your question, I think I can share the recent uh, discussion happened uh, for the global goal on adaptation. So there is uh, a suggested approach uh, like the four tiers 
to achieve the global goal. So the first one, uh, first level will be, uh, you know, with survival. <laughs> with survival in the uh, crisis, and uh, then there will be build resilience uh, in front of, uh, mid, uh, in the midst of a climate crisis. And after that, we kind of like seek opportunities because adaptation and the de uh, sustainable development is close uh, linked to each other. So we seek achieving the sustainable development goals, uh, you know, in the climate, in the changing climate. And then at the fourth level, maybe we can aim for transformative, uh, you know, changes or, you know, transformative uh, uh, systems uh, built uh, in changing climate. So that could be like the different, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, different, uh, um, how to say that, uh, uh, different goal settings. If we, if we look at the different uh, terms or like the different contexts uh, when we are discussing adaptation. <laughs> and uh, of course we survival first and then do more things uh, within our capacity. Can I, can I add to that? Uh, please go ahead, Martin. Yeah, uh, if if I may, I know we we are reaching the hour and and we have to be uh, time uh, time uh, conscious. Uh, two quick comments to add to what Ying said, uh, you know, commenting on what uh, David uh, uh, pulled forward. I mean, David, you made uh, two very important comments. You talked about short sightedness. This is one of the major problems. I mean, you talk about six months forecasting uh, on the on the economic side. You know, it, this is about political will, right? I mean, politicians, they look uh, not further than the next election, which is uh, at most in four or five years, depending on the government and the country, right? So so that that's a problem. If we talk about climate change, what is happening by 2050, what is happening by, uh, by the end of the century, it is too far away for politicians. So we need citizens to stand up and tell their politicians uh, uh, what to do. This is so important. And uh, this, this is one. And the other one is, you know, what, what qualifies as adaptation? Uh, we need to look at effectiveness here. Of course, not everything is adaptation, what is being done and can be qualified as that. That's a very important one. But we have to look at effectiveness because a lot of money goes to adaptation, but in the end, uh, it's not effective. It's not contributing sufficiently to you know, uh, adequate adaptation. So that's another field uh, that we are uh, starting to engage in, you know, to measure effectiveness of adaptation action that is being implemented. Just two quick comments. Sorry, uh, uh, colleagues, I'm, I was taking the floor perhaps too long because we are uh, over the hour now, sorry. Back to you, Manishka. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you, David, for your thoughts. And uh, Ying and Martin, those were some really insightful answers to the Q&A session. Thank you so much, Ying, for the wonderful and comprehensive talk today and for staying up so late. I know it's past 11 p.m. for you now, so we won't keep you any further. I just want to uh, thank all the participants participants for being here today and just mention that the objective of the book and the webinar series is to reach students, teachers, professionals, and all interested people across the world, especially in regions with limited resources. So please share these resources with, with uh, people you know who might find this useful. Thank you so much for your participation. And um, I just want to also mention about the final um, webinar that we have in two weeks. So Jen, we can move to that slide. Just to say that we have this final lecture, um, Adaptation to Climate Change by Thea Dickinson and Ian Burton. Then we will have a panel discussion and breakout groups. It will be a very interactive to our session. Please join us for that. And uh, thank you so much for your participation today and see you in two weeks. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much, Joel. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.